Good afternoon, everyone. This is Judy Lundperson from NHPCO. We are so delighted to have you joining us for this second webinar on current and emerging CMS payment models. Um, this is a exciting and scary, I think both, both uh, words apply, um, exciting and scary time for um, hospice providers, and we are so delighted to have Jeremy Powell from Acclivity um, to help us walk through what some of the opportunities are as well as how hospices might prepare. So I'm not going to take any more time than is necessary. Um, Jeremy, I'll turn it over to you. Thanks, Judy. Uh, appreciate the opportunity to engage the members again, um, and certainly appreciate you, Kendra, Lori, and Ito for allowing uh, us the opportunity to use some of our experience, some 20 years of managing alternative payment model risk uh, in this approach that will help you all through today and recognizing that you have a period of time to begin to get ready for what's uh, the emerging application process and period. Um, we'll talk a little bit about that as well as part of our discussion today. But first and foremost, thank you for the opportunity. And uh, we look forward to hearing from many of the members about what we're going to uh, speak through today. So on, uh, on today's agenda, we're going to first do a recap of the uh, original uh, capabilities that we described in the first webinar. And I'm sorry, Kendra, I'm not being able to advance the slides. Can you? There we go. So let's uh, high level agenda. Let's make sure that we can um, first recap. We did a primer webinar. There's a recording of that webinar out on the EDGE uh, page. We're an EDGE partner for NHPCO. So you can go and listen to that recap. Um, we're going to talk through specifically um, the history related to the uh, program that rolls out. We're going to talk about how one gets ready for the program. We're also going to talk about um, the specifics of opportunities relative to not only readiness, but what kinds of patients will roll into this program and what patient opportunities there will be um, for folks to transition those patients from SIP to, to a hospice benefit. So why CMS, remember this initial portion uh, of the program is just to remind us about, you know, sort of what was the primer, the webinar, why is CMS doing this? So the biggest issue related to CMS and these alternative payment models, this is one of 12 uh, that actually takes shape for us, um, one of 12 that takes shape for us in January. We're going to focus on SIP, but the SIP uh, is only a portion of those total rollout um, in January. The reality for all of us is that the solvency of Medicare is significantly in, under uh, pressure, really based upon the fact that we're aging in 10,000 persons a day onto the benefit and about uh, that number every day for the next 15 years. And the benefit itself isn't aging in that same number of taxpayers. So we have a need specifically to help them address uh, the items related to the cost of care because of this baby boomer population shifting into the, uh, uh, the Medicare particular plan. And again, I'm sorry, Kendra, I'm, I'm advancing the slides, but they're not advancing on my end. We're working on it. Yep. So, all right, thank you very much. So, um, the eligible region. So, be mindful that although the federal government sees this as an opportunity to potentially diminish Part A spend, and by Part A spend, I mean specifically emergency utilization and hospitalizations, um, what they're also doing is opening up a large enough part of the population such that they can have an opportunity to really leverage the hospice benefit as a mechanism to drive opportunities for hospice providers to perform. Uh, seriously ill population uh, care. So forget stage of disease, forget prognosis in your mindset for the rest of today. This is all going to be about helping a person live with serious illness as the cornerstone. Your expectations in this program across all of those markets is to provide a case management function where you have the opportunity to see these patients six times over 12 years or every 60 day or 12 months over every 60 days you'd have the opportunity to interface with them in a face-to-face -face consult, and who better than you and your interdisciplinarians to have the opportunity to educate the patients about their options, curative and, and comfort, about their goals related to end-of-life care, about the advanced directives and codes they may want to follow as they enter the last uh, corridor of life, uh, than your staff and the federal government's betting on you uh, 
to be able to manage these patients across these states over the course of 12 months with a visit every other uh, month, and they will net, uh, you will net an individual payment for capitation of $275 and then $50 per visit in this program. To be eligible for this program, you really just need to have the opportunity to supply what you do today as a hospice. You all have an interdisciplinary approach. You all provide comprehensive care. You all document goals of care. You all have uh, uh, familial support and offer that to the patient's family, and you all have 24 by 7 access. So you're uniquely uh, appropriately aligned to the paradigm of hospice. So the next things that we would look at specifically are how much opportunity by patient type is going to be available to an agency for engagement. So the blue bar shows the number of decedents. The line above that shows the minimum and maximum threshold by federal government estimates that will be allocated or attributed into this program. So it is um, a significant opportunity. We're seeing an average patient engagement for each hospice to be somewhere over 200% of the patients served by that agency today. So imagine the offense you're going to get to play with that number of patients being in the program. You also will be able to protect your agency's current census by managing patients as they, again, align closer and closer to the hospice benefit. So let's talk a little bit about what today specifically. So that was the background or big opportunity, 22 total states, all of the um, all of the patients who are inside of a uh, seriously ill uh, scenario by attribution will have a transition have to happen before the 12 month period is up by the regulations. You can have exceptions, but by regulation, your opportunity is to manage these patients and allow them the opportunity to understand better about their options and transition them out of uh, the program of SIP and into where appropriate the program for hospice. So it's an incredible windfall to get that upstream opportunity. You're also going to be in this world getting three years or up to three years worth of data at the initial attribution with opportunities every month to get incremental data from CMS directly about these patients. So be mindful that that's the paradigm. And let's talk about today how you get ready for those things. So this is pre-application. This webinar is being recorded um, certainly just before the application is released on the portal. We're hearing from CMS specifically and directly that a number of things are now uh, removed from being able to re uh, report the opening of the paradigm uh, for being able to apply or the portal for applications. What that means is according to all signs that this is an imminent application opening, but they've given us a deadline of no later than uh, the beginning of November, which means you have this time to write your uh, templated responses for narratives around what your capabilities are uh, and to be ready for that. But this discussion today isn't yet about the application program. That'll be webinar three that we'll do in a few weeks. This discussion today is how do you get ready for the inevitable when the application opens, when you're allowed to participate, when you sign a participant agreement and get attribution, what things should your agency be doing today relative to uh, readiness? And so we're gonna talk about the posture of getting ready. The rest of this discussion is gonna be about those particular items. So. First and foremost, there is a huge benefit and a set of benefits that apply to this particular program for hospices to get aligned. First of which, it aligns nicely to your mission. Almost all of the agencies we've talked with, and we've done almost 100 assessments so far of agencies across all of the SIP states, almost all of the agencies recognize the value of the program. It aligns to their mission, it aligns to their strategic vision, it aligns to their goals to deliver innovative models of care and to drive hospice as the cornerstone of their agency. Second, most agencies have had some run at being able to deliver new service lines. This program is going to pay you to innovate. It's going to allow you to unlock the potential of your staff being able to see patients further upstream and get you largely out of the current paradigm, which is managing patients in crisis care, crisis care who are actively dying in the last corridor of life. This program is going to give you up to 12 months to look at these patients and to help them because of their serious illness, understand what options are available using your social workers, using your RN staff, using a new type of staff. If you don't have care coordinators, you can evolve to have non-clinical licensed care coordinators and driving patient engagement. Uh, so new service line development under 
This program, while payments are going to push the potential margins to 20 to 25% at scale, so that's an off, awesome opportunity for each agency to take this opportunity specifically around those dollars and drive new services upstream. The second of which is you're going to further ingrain your organization into community networks. So this program is a transition program. If there are patients that will not convert to hospice, either uh, for emotional, spiritual, or physical uh, reasons, you would still have the need to manage them. So if you have a home health agency that you partner with or if you own home health, um, you will have the opportunity specifically to recognize that these patients can make use of that benefit while also being on the seriously ill population paradigm. You also position your agency for the CARB, and it's inevitable. That train is starting to um, build its way uh, towards uh, getting momentum and taking shape in that uh, specific program will be the need for you to contract with and being able to manage the care of patients at a global risk model that Medicare under the MA Carbon will include. You get to sign contracts in this paradigm with managed players. This, is, this grew out of CMS in the primary care side. The precursor to this was the CPC Plus and before that comprehensive primary care, which is what CPC stands for. Those programs have been around for about five years and MedAdvantage has been included in those programs for all of those years. So we'll see many hundreds of MA plans across all 22 states, uh, also informing contracts that you can sign for the exact same benefits for patients related to the Medicare benefit for SIP. Um, you're going to get to establish and deepen your relationships through referrals, as well as deepen your relationships with those MedAdvantage players. And then lastly, you're going to build a narrow network. None of this should scare you. You already know where your referrals come from. Just what's going to happen in this new world is you're going to be able to refer for patients that aren't hospice appropriate into an advanced primary care practice that you have a good relationship with. So over time, those things will become important for us to recognize. We're going to talk to them individually today for the rest of the slides. So let's talk a little bit first before we get into the, the ideas of mission and all the other items that align here from a SIP perspective. Let's talk about who you are. So it would be a mistake for anyone delivering any kind of content over webinar or in person not to know our audience. So Acclivity itself recognizes that if you've seen uh, one hospice agency, you've seen one and no two are alike, then you have a ton of variety and variation. So this is not meant to diminish the incredible services you're providing, but we need to bucket um, uh, the kinds of agencies that are at least some recognizable uh, way that you can say, okay, I kind of fit mostly in this, in this particular segment or in that particular segment. The way we chose to do this isn't by size. Um, it's about looking at the fact that these full spectrum agencies that are represented on today's webinar um, are as different as you could imagine from a perspective of being able to supply services based upon how they've evolved over time. We could have talked about this. We could have talked about your sites of service. We could have talked about whether you're in a COA state or not. It's not exhaustive. We're just looking at a simple segmentation. Um, so what is your current scope today? What do you currently deliver? Are you hospice only? Are you starting to evolve into some pre-hospice services? Or do you have a mature pre-hospice approach that includes building, um, you know, contracted services with payers? That's the question of the, uh, 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 at first uh, that we're going to want to answer because all of the slides build off of who you are. So for the hospice-only agencies out there who have built an incredible, strong uh, presence in the market delivering hospice services, we see you as being incredibly well-positioned for this program. Um, it doesn't matter that you don't have an advanced illness model or a palliative program or any other uh, transitions or bridge programs already established. What matters is you meet the eligibility for having an interdisciplinary approach and that you perform services, uh, at least telephonically, you have access to your staff 24 by 7. So this part of our um, world can be well served by SIP. This agency aligns nicely. The second agency takes that first agency and has evolved and started to build out practices that are upstream from traditional hospice. This would look like some of the bridge programs, transitions programs, uh, community engagement programs, volunteer work. Um, many of these are under uh, reimbursed or unpaid. You often do this as charity work or some other form of limited reimbursement for these services. Um, all of those agencies, again, well positioned to be able to support SIP. And then lastly, 
are the industrial strength sized um, uh, agencies, not from a scale of, of, of ADC or number of markets served, but from a clinical model and breadth of services perspective. These persons and agencies have really done um, a significant amount of work in dedicating staff to service lines above and beyond hospice. They provide a whole host of services that could look like palliative pace, advanced, uh, advanced directive consulting, community and faith-based consulting and services, district or other kinds of payment models uh, would find themselves um, sort of naturally aligned to these kinds of, of, of agencies. Again, um, ideally, you are in the same situation where many of the uh, agency types that, that you would see that make up this kind have done enough of services that you recognize how to model not only operational staff, clinical staff, but you understand how to do the financial uh, FBNA, the financial planning and analysis, you are obviously as well aligned nicely to fit into this paradigm. So we're going to ask a question uh, for each of you. So a polling question for us, if you don't mind, Kendra and team, relative to what kinds of, of agency are you today? So up on the slide, which of the best, which of these best describes the services that your organization offers today? Are you hospice only? Uh, are you some pre-hospice services or many matured pre-hospice services? So if you'll please vote. Okay, Kendra. See what we have as the voting population here. Good, so a good mix. About a quarter of you are hospice only. About a quarter of you have uh, defined yourselves as being many and mature pre-hospice services, and about half of you are sort of in the middle, which is great. That's an excellent um, uh, distribution. And again, none of you are excluded or included in any way more or less than others, as long as you meet the eligibility requirements. We like to see that kind of information, though, to be honest with you, um, just so that we have the sort of the best understanding of what you've been through um, so that we can best align our talk and our content to your specific needs. So let's talk about the, the, the rest of our time today. It's going to be largely aligned to how do we inform a readiness posture and get you thinking about what staffing, um, incremental staffing would be uh, at play here. What budgets do you need to potentially inform if we're entering your budget season now? Um, what are you doing relative to this program, relative to your budget? How would we expand the mission and, and drive a cultural acceptance and adoption uh, of this particular new program? Um, what are we going to do from a clinical perspective? What are we doing from a data and analytics perspective? Should we think about branding um, something different under this program? Uh, is there a documentation requirement that we need to be thinking about including in our EMR or other solutions that are technical? What about my infrastructure on call center or on call? Am I always going to do this telephonically? Do I have to need uh, or have to have round the clock uh, interventions that can happen in the field? And then last, um, what should we be thinking about from a, a network and contracting perspective? Because again, MedAdvantage comes into this program in a significant way starting in uh, January. So for the rest of the slides, we're going to talk through those components and getting you into a posture where you're ready for uh, those particular uh, scenarios. So again, Kendra, I think uh, when we did the polling, I don't have access to it. Let's go to the next slide. Oops, there we go. So we'll start in the center of that previous slide with data and analytics. And uh, I'm going to give you my quick um, conflict of interest statement. This is in no way a, an attempt to be a commercial player relative to our solution. The reality of what we want to make sure that you are aware of, we are an analytics company, but we believe any organization, whether it's primary care, a hospice agency, an ACO, um, if you are in a, an alternative payment model and you are going to be given the right to claims history from the Medicare cloud, you are purposefully putting yourself in harm's way by not taking that opportunity and using anyone's uh, analytics to support making decisions uh, about these patients. So we specifically 
are in the field of analytics, so that's my conflict of interest statement. I know it's important for us and all of our customers, but I know we have a long way to go to get all of you as customers. Our expectation isn't to drive that as the thought today. Our expectation is for you to realize that entering into this alternative payment model um, without an analytics solution, an analytic solution really is a, um, a recipe for disaster. Here's why. You're going to have an opportunity to predict palliative performance scale out of this data. You're going to have an opportunity to predict admission and readmission out of this data. Um, think about this program. The only things you get measured from this program is how much acute and emergency room admission and utilization did you diminish over every month against the benchmark. So if you can't measure it, you can't manage it. So you're going to need to predict those admission or readmission. You also should react, not just from knowing that there's data that shows this is a probability, but if your patients who are on SIP are whitelisted with any of the um, admission, discharge, and transfer real-time notice uh, capabilities, many of them are provided by the state HIEs in these states. Others are provided by commercial organizations. Um, you should be listening to those and get real-time alert notices so that you can react to someone who enters a facility that literally is going to penalize you in this program. So you should be looking at frailty out of this data. You should be looking at the patient's needs from an acuity perspective. Can they be independent? Um, do they have familial support? Um, you should recognize how much of your team needs to be involved. Is this person a significant risk from a social and psychosocial perspective? Therefore, if the answer is yes from the data and the analysis of that data, your social worker needs to be cornerstone to that team. And you need to be able to recognize I know we all struggle with um, SIA payments and recognizing when those uh, last, uh, very last quarter order of lives become sort of the, the, the status of the patient. In an analytics tool, that becomes part of what you can manage and measure based upon getting data incrementally every month, not only from your encounters with staff, but also from the federal government giving you access to claims data specifically. So that's what's ahead of us. And the data part is just a portion. Now what do you need to know about these patients is tied to the patients themselves. So we think about cohorts as being uh, a driver for the decisions you'd make around how do you staff, how does this align to your mission, how does that mission align to the needs of the patient and therefore your ability to build a clinical model that doesn't disrupt your hospice, which again is the core of your mission. So these are the cohort descriptions that we have seen time and time again in programs that get, um, their, in, 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 uh, to get their starts from attribution. The federal government is going to attribute somewhere between uh, two and three times your current service in hospice today with patients who, by their definition, are high risk. The federal government, using CMS data from uh, interactions with the system and, and utilization of healthcare, predicts for every single Medicare patient an HCC, a hierarchical condition code risk adjustment factor or risk score. That score will attribute them into this program. What you need to know from that is, are they appropriate near term for hospice or will they over the course of this 12 months be appropriate and eligible for the benefit? So without an analytic system, it's going to be only assessments that will drive that and only your staff who can and go and make those decisions. With an analytics, that's core to the analytics itself, being able to predict those kinds of components. And then I want to tell you just, uh, you know, so that you know these two that are shaded, all of the data that we've ever seen about patients that meet the criteria to get into SIP validate the, the perspective that about 50% of these patients that will come into this program will end up being hospice patients and adopt that uh, specific uh, scenario uh, service before 12 months is up. About 50% of them will need to be stabilized and then you'll need to predict a, or uh, project a um, relationship with primary care that you can refer them to as you've stabilized and educated about appropriate types of services that don't include an uh, emergency room for flu symptoms, that don't include uh, the hospital as a core primary care center. And for those patients, once you've stabilized and educated them, you're going to want to ensure that those patients have access to advanced primary care. You don't need to provide it. You can refer to it. But be mindful, the big aha here is about 50% of these cohorts are going to make it into these two near, ho near hospice appropriate or medium term in the six, uh, six to 12 month range. And so we validated this, and this is the line of sight you'll have in this program for your hospice paradigm. 
let's talk about staffing. And I want to start at the bottom. So in any program that you're ever going to adopt that's pre-hospice, you're going to have to build a staffing model that ties itself, hopefully, to the economics of that program. One of the things that this particular seriously ill population program has as its cornerstone or definition is that you need to be a 24 by 7 accessible clinical team to have the ability to support patients. So if you today have at the bottom infrastructure related to call centers, you need to recognize that some of that call center infrastructure won't just be responding to hospice hotline calls. They will also be responding to patients who are in the seriously ill population program and will have very different needs. They will need um, access to scheduling patient appointments that you can help or, not, or choose to not help if you don't support any administrative functions out of your team. You still need to be able to answer the phone. You still need to have that staff with parts of the clinical team. Um, but that's uh, part of what you'd want to work on and ensuring your, your readiness posture gives you the opportunity to focus on 24 by 7 coverage. Um, that coverage largely will be for the 50% that are the non-hospice eligible over the 12-month telephonic. And then you'll staff some of your on-call coverage for those folks that are just at the precipice of being eligible for hospice or are already eligible but haven't elected the benefit. You would make decisions as you would today in any of your programs that, that might look like a transition program if you have them around being able to, okay, this person's really ready. They've cleared the spiritual or family um, hurdle, and they're now going to adopt the posture of, of aligning to hospice. Let's go have a, um, a hospice nurse till the pre-election uh, service that patient. You'll need to build, if you don't already have, you'll need to build care coordination functions into that call center. They'll almost never be field staff that come and, uh, and, and interact with the patients in any way in the field. They will largely be the rapid triage portion of your call center to recognize that this SIP person who's calling does need access to an RN or doesn't. Could it be a question about what is my next appointment scheduled? Can I have a call tomorrow with a nurse? Those things should not be as you wouldn't, you know, have your uh, front office managed by MDDOs. You wouldn't have your call center managed by RNs at the, at the, at the initial uh, point of that call. You'd want to have at least a quick triage to the, to the clinical or administrative. So you'll need to build that scenario if you don't yet have it into the tooling. And then let's talk about the folks that fit in those three buckets. So remember the three buckets were near-term hospice, medium-term hospice, and then primary care focus. So for your near-term hospice, this would largely align to what you currently do in hospice, except you're going to vary the amount of care and intensity of that care based upon how close to that actual adoption of the hospice benefit are the patients and the family. As they get closer, it'll look a lot like your pre-election services as they are a little further out. We'll do more telephonic support, more, um, uh, you know, again, aligning to SIP itself, which is every other month as a face-to-face -face visit perspective. Medium-term hospice is almost all uh, telephonic support with uh, an MD or um, DO or nurse practitioner with uh, them providing oversight. The question has been asked to CMS. There was a little bit of vagueness in the response, but almost all of the services that you would be able to bill for under E&M codes in the face-to-face -face world will be billable in this world, whether it's an RN uh, or a social worker or an DDO. Uh, our nurse practitioner uh, doing the services in the face-to-face. -face. So be mindful that you're going to want to staff according to the license that you get to reimburse the $50 fee for for any of the visit types that are supported in the program. Uh, and so you'll want to make that decision about oversight largely based upon your RNs and so licensed social workers that play a role in this. And then lastly, the primary care cohort, which are the folks that just aren't going to convert um, in the timeline relative to the SIP program of 12 months, largely telephonic, only at the top of the RN license for that support, because again, you're just giving them access to clinicians who can help them make the better decisions that limit the emergencies and the uh, acute admission uh, as the cornerstone of, of success in this program. Let's talk about care provision. So that was staffing. Now we're going to talk about the kinds of care. So I mentioned before your staffing models for those near-term hospice patients are going to mimic or look a lot like your hospice staffing model. Um, you're going to make sure that in the provision of care, you're doing family engagement, you're managing the four quadrants of the patient, specifically including social workers and the needs of the patient from a social and psychosocial perspective into the care plan. You're going to want to remove the common barriers that we talked about before, spiritual, emotional, 
uh, intellectual, et cetera, around the adoption of the, of the paradigm of hospice. And then the midterm folks, those are the ones that are going to convert in six to 12 month period. They're going to require more touch. You're going to see we have um, a population curve that I'll show you in a minute. They're going to acquire a little bit more care management over time. They may need to have encounters with primary carers. Those primary carers could include specialists. So if they're a COPD patient, um, you would want to, again, maybe provide a referral opportunity from you to the COPD specialist during hay, hay fever season if they're having uh, exacerbated issues with shortness of breath. Um, and then obviously the last one, almost all of what you're going to attempt to do is as quickly as possible for folks that we can recognize not being appropriate for hospice over the course of the 12 months. You want to make sure that you have a good paradigm and, and being able to manage referrals right back to primary care where, where appropriate. We talked about documentation as a need. Almost always the paradigm for near hospice is going to look like hospice. So those patients that are going to really be eligible day one, you can, you can convert them to hospice in that initial assessment. Again, part of why an analytics tool would be helpful is how do you know what part of the staff to send on that initial visit if you can't have visibility to the patient needs. You're always going to be able to catch, uh, capture the goals of care, understand any proxy or power of attorney relationships, build out the care plans or goals of care related to their um, codes, and then obviously align all of that to advanced directives, pulsed and most if they're supported in your state. For near hospice, you'll do some of the similar things, but again, you're going to be supporting more of the needs of the patient as a uh, care manager, including potentially supporting inter interactions and interventions for Part B billing that you get paid $50 per face-to-face -face encounter. This is, again, where you can use your social workers, you can use your RN staff, and from what we look, what it looks like, this is going to look like a general oversight. Um, the, the regs aren't out yet, but what we're hearing from CMS is uh, direct supervision is not required. Uh, general supervision policy was likely what's going to be rolled out for these NM codes, um, but look for us to confirm that as the final regs make their way into published um, uh, portals related to your application process. And then lastly, in primary care, you're largely going to be understanding what are their specific needs that have driven them to use the emergency room and the hospital. Why are they showing um, that as a preferred uh, access point to the healthcare ecosystem? Most of your care will be, again, supporting these patients, choosing better locations of care, better sites of services from a cost perspective, and then, again, building the documentation that would allow you in a referral paradigm to give as much detail as you can because these are going to become your referral sources back for your hospice and sip like programs as this program continues to evolve uh, with iterations that will come down from CMS. We talked about on-call coverage. Um, parts of what you expect on on-call coverage is going to align to, again, the needs of the patient. So for folks that are in that near-term or mid-term hospice, you'll make decisions based upon what are we really looking at here relative to the patient? Is this a call for help because of a psychosocial need and therefore we need to apply a social worker? Is this a call for help because they're actually entering into a part of the journey that aligns best with hospice being the benefit of record? So you'll, you'll mostly follow your hospice model. Uh, again, for primary care, almost all of it's gonna be call center, almost all of it's gonna be telephonic, almost all of it's going to be one non-clinical and coordination. Again, that's where that staffing model, that first uh, or second slide told us, let's make sure that we have the ability to recognize that our staff itself is going to need to include care coordinators as a core component of uh, the uh, staff for infrastructure and, and the telephonic call center. I promised in an earlier slide that we were going to chat specifically about what is the, what is the shape of the population curve. So if we believe that... Um, the validation of our tool has shown specifically, I'm trying to get to present fully on my side. Are you guys seeing a little breakup of primary care on your side or is that just my slide? Okay, so, hold on. yeah, sorry. I don't know why there's something wrong with the graphics between my machine and Zoom, but let's, um, let's go back to, to that one slide if you don't one before. Hang on, I'm trying to get control again. I apologize. There we go. All right, so let's talk about, perfect, it's cleaned up in this version. So let's talk about this, the, the, the site of care as it relates to the total population and how that population should 
look almost across every state um, that's in this scenario. Yes, healthcare is regional, even down to the zip code and, and even more narrow than that. Um, but I want us to recognize that it's an 80-20 rule. Most of what we're going to see in the population are about 40 or, or so percent of this population is going to be that primary care cohort that may have high risk, but aren't from a prognosis perspective appropriate, aren't from uh, the regs related to hospice appropriate, are not going to be appropriate in the near term or middle, middle term. So that's going to be a part that you'd largely leverage your care coordinators telephonically to deliver all support. There'll be some education and motivational interviewing that you'll do for those patients to understand specifically about their access preferences and why they've used um, hospital and emergency rooms for primary care related services. You'll look at the data that we have um, about these patients and who their typical primary carer is, and you can make use of that to refer back to them. You'll find out in this world that patients aren't going to primary care for primary care services, largely because if they're on an oncology journey and they're a diabetic, the, the medicines they're going to use for oncology are going to affect their blood sugar levels. So the oncologist has actually just picked up a lot of what would be the HbA1c requirements for primary care or foot and eye exam. He's actually doing that work on behalf of the patient. So you don't need to provide extra support. You just need to support these patients making better decisions about where they go for standard care that is at the hospital emergency room. So again, you'll try to stabilize them, educate them, motivationally interview them, and then promote them back to primary care. For the other two parts, which are the 50% roughly that make up the hospice cohort, we're going to look at the trough part, the, the portion that's uh, going to have the, the fewer of the patients than the other two. You're going to look at those as a a, a set of patients where you're going to attempt as best you can to build trust, to build rapport, to establish a foundation with them, to ask them, you know, how they're doing. All of these patients are going to be living with seriously uh, serious illness, and it can be in the form of uh, renal disease or, or uh, cardiac disease or pulmonary issues or dementia or cognitive-related decline. All of those things, you're going to need to engage the family, the patient, understand what their needs are. And then as you build trust and you start building that rapport, you will then have the opportunity to determine with the tooling that you get from the analysis and with your staff doing the assessment, when in that six to 12 months, they're going to become more appropriate for hospice. So you'll have fewer of them than the next group, which is great news for us. We validated this with nearly 3 million patients um, where we've looked at the attribution model from CMS and we've looked at what that attribution has done for hospice utilization. And we're seeing a big part of this um, population is going to be pent up demand for hospice that just hasn't made its way into some crisis care where the, they've been told by some part of the ecosystem that, hey, we just are out of options. Hospice is the last, sort of the last line of defense here. And that is the paradigm, thank goodness for us in this world, that won't happen for these patients. We're going to get them. We're going to recognize where they are in the, in the last corridor of life. We're going to use our interdisciplinary approach. And we're actually going to convert these patients appropriate to the service and get much more of the six-month benefit than we ever would out of a skilled nursing facility or our hospital stay under a crisis care, um, uh, uh, you know, crisis care situation. So that's what we expect to see. Again, remember, you're going to get paid the same amount, that $275 capitated amount, whether they're in the first cohort for primary care, the middle cohort for midterm hospice, or the, uh, the best, most advantaged, advantageous for us in that near-term hospice, you're going to get paid the same amount. So leverage your staff to do the things that will also inform your mission of hospice, which is to ensure you're building rapport with the midterm ones and that you're building uh, your pre-election services into the near-term. What I want to talk about next is the opportunity for us to recognize um, that culture and change is difficult. I'm going to back up and go forward again to see if I can get this slide to paint all the way. Um, the culture of change is one that you would need to ensure your change management staff, your personnel um, that you are going to involve in this new program, that they all have an opportunity specifically uh, to understand the the newness of this program doesn't mean you have to approach it without using your experience in change management. So incorporate the messaging of pre-hospice or non-hospice care into your current mission because, again, you're going to get to see somewhere north of 200% of your patients served in this program. 
and you're going to get to have your hands on the reins and, and have command and control of, of developing relationships and rapport and trust and developing your staff and their ability to have these conversations, the courageous conversations. We know that if we could have them with patients, we would convert far more into the hospice benefit much sooner. Um, you're going to need to create a program that has its own identity and ownership over time. We would recommend for no agency to th for them to go hire staff today um, as, as incremental just for SIP alone. We think that all of your staffing will come directly out of the services that you offer, even if you're hospice only today. That staff should have capacity across some of it to support being able to pick up parts of the equation related to the seriously ill population, but you still need to create a program and identity uh, uh, for this particular program and have folks that own the outcomes. And then lastly, what I hope all of us need to uh, recognize is that in readiness, you always would need to be thinking about succession. There are going to be SIP uh, uh, troughs and there are going to be SIP peaks where you're going to get a lot of influx of patients in the first three months of next year. That, that influx is going to be pent up to ban for hospice. You know how to manage that. You're also going to get a lot of patients that get in that are just going to not be appropriate over the course of the 12 months, and you're going to need to manage those. So celebrate some of the non-hospice components of this program, because again, it's about visibility, it's about pipeline, it's about diminishing variab variables that you can control when you have this level of visibility into the patient cases and their families. So, so let's get a uh, posture in this particular part of readiness that adopts this culture. One of the things all of us need, need to be thinking about, if you haven't yet built some form of brand that doesn't include hospice, you would want to build that into your current uh, go-to-market thinking, and you would want to ensure that you may have some staff that does SIP on the same day they do hospice, on the same day um, they do other services that you offer. Great. They could have three white coats in their car because your social worker staff is going to be used across multiple different service lines. They just need to present themselves appropriately when they're going to meet for this initial assessment for SIF, they need to present themselves as a person looking to support living with advanced illness, living with serious illness. And everyone, um, unfortunately, has biased hospice to be something that is truly only about and centered around death. Um, unfortunately for all of us, that's the, the premise under which we currently operate. What I would tell us all to be thinking about is a way to get around that obstacle is through branding, is through coming up with um, messaging that's appropriate, that doesn't call out hospice, that doesn't uh, leverage palliative because that gets equated with hospice, that really becomes uh, in and of itself a mechanism to support persons and their ability to live with serious, Ill uh, serious illness. I've heard great names thrown about um, that are going to be used in this market. I would suggest you use your team to think about and think about using culture before this um, how better to get your team excited, jazzed about this opportunity than having them come up with parts of what that brand is, parts of what the names are going to be. And then the last one would again be thinking for us about not only would brand be important, but you've got an opportunity in this new world to build contracts with Med Advantage players. They're going to come in. Um, they're going to expect you to, to be able to narrow networks so that they can have reliable, high quality, ideally lower cost uh, capabilities being deployed under this model. An alternative payment model at its root relies on diminishing total cost of care while maintaining or improving the quality of care. So in a network and contracting world, you'd want to be able to, again, recognize in that near hospice, the pent up demand we're going to see out of that part of this um, group of patients we're going to recognize you're going to immediately have the opportunity to contract with MedAdvantage, and you're going to immediately need to make sure you can do internally uh, handoffs without there being inefficiency. So someone who promotes um, into SIP in month one and then immediately is recognized as having need for and an adoption of the hospice benefit, that needs to not take any time for your clinical team to be able to get them from one uh, uh, service line to another service line. The same is true on the midterm. Again, you've got to make those two things happen. You also have to recognize there are going to be gaps in what you can deliver. You're not going to be taking on primary care as you would define it today in most instances. You're going to be partnering for primary care. You're going to be partnering with specialists. You're going to be making use of um, the specialties within your own 
uh, interdisciplinary approach uh, within your own staff, but you're also going to be referring using your coordinators out to the community that you serve. And if you do that well, you can build preferred relationships, or even better, you can build a network or exclusive relationship with some of those organizations for a quid pro quo. I'll give you these patients that aren't appropriate for hospice in the middle term or the near term um, so that you can have them attributed to your uh, agency as, as potential parts of your ACO, as parts of your primary care first, primary care side. In exchange, when your patients qualify for services we offer, we would expect us to deliver high quality hospice care. You, we expect you to deliver high quality palliative um, primary care, I'm sorry. Um, so let's make that exchange and let's define it if we can as a preferred relationship, but ideally, let's build a network. Let's do a joint venture. Let's get into those levels of contracting. And so that's part of what you'd want to be readying yourself for. None of that has to happen. But over the course of time, this program can be your first step or your second or your third step into building those kinds of components. Last slide of the day, and then we'll take the questions. I've seen we've had about 20 questions come in through the chat. Um, so how can we help you make decisions? It's a lot to think about from a readiness perspective. The application's about to open. As I mentioned at the beginning, we think that's in the next few days, uh, but certainly before, say, the first week of November at the very latest, they had knocked down a few big things that were keeping that from being um, uh, part of what we were going to be able to do in the portal. Those things we've heard from CMS are now closed. Therefore, they're tying off loose ends. We expect it to open any moment. When it does open, we'd love to help you apply um, for a number of reasons. We know what looks like an appropriate agency uh, for getting the right level of capacity, for getting the ability to support the patients and therefore getting more attribution. So we'd love that opportunity to work on your behalf and helping you to write uh, your templated but narrative uh, responses to the application. We'd also love the opportunity, as I mentioned before, we're a data and analytics company. We'd love the opportunity to look at the data you're going to get about the patients and help you quickly re uh, recognize how many and how many fit into that hospice near-term or middle-term uh, cohort. We'd love to look at, um, and we do this with all of our assessments, how to build a financial plan that uh, ties your strategy in this particular program to serving the mission of your organization, which is at the cornerstone is hospice, as well as serving the needs of all the other things you have to build margin for to deliver as charitable care. This program can support 20 to 25% margin. I know margin gets played out in deliverables that look like charitable care. Let's not shy away from that opportunity to deliver what your communities need by ensuring we have a model that drives adoption, that drives um, uh, incremental staffing to support what can be used, again, in other ways in your agency to support outcomes for the needs of your patients. We'd love to do a people process and gap analysis that includes a technology uh, and EHR and reporting requirements look. Uh, and then lastly, we're going to look to, uh, to the rest of this to ensure that you have contract opportunities with community partners, including Med Advantage and primary and specialty carers in your community. And then we didn't do this on our own. The models that I just mentioned have been validated by third parties that had no um, insight to our tooling. Um, if you can get uh, into this program, the financials are there. The alignment to mission is there. We also would leverage, uh, and you have access to our advisory team, which includes folks like John Mulder, uh, Arif Kamal, uh, as examples of folks that looked in at and advised us on the clinical models. And then, and then lastly, we would, um, as this program begins, would be incredibly lucky and fortunate to take advantage of the data you're going to get in these programs to help you refer all of that 50% that's hospice eligible into your agency before that 12-month TIP program actually requires you to transition them elsewhere. So we'd love to do that. NHBC as an EDGE partner has given us the opportunity to give you all a 10% discount in this program. We would have, um, and, and, and we would think that's an excellent opportunity for you guys to make, uh, adva take advantage of our EDGE partnership and NHPCO's um, graciousness in offering that 10% discount. Question. Okay, Jeremy, thank you so much for all of this really great uh, head-spinning information. And um, I want to jump right in with the time we have left just to uh, go through some of the questions. Um, so I think we'll, we'll start with some of the questions we've gotten um, in the um, chat box. Um, if a patient goes to hospice and stabilizes, can they go back to the SIP program? So according to what's out and published, that's an unknown. What we know about the design of the program 
is that is that yes, if the attribution qualities still are there relative to that patient, meaning you're not going to have diminished um, the risk of the patient, you will probably in that hospice journey have diminished almost all, if not all, hospital spend. But but the mechanism for getting them back into SIP hasn't yet been defined. Our guess, and this is pre. Uh, deliver the full regs. Our guess is that you'll have the rights to refer back to that program, but that'll play out in the application when it opens in the next few weeks. Right. Okay. Um, another question: uh, Can are LPNs eligible to provide any support, or does it have to be an RN? So far, the the licensure by uh, clinician uh, illuminates for all of us that it's an MDDO or uh, nurse practitioner at the top of the pod, and then other clinicians that can bill, so far by definition, are licensed social workers and RNs. So that's the current makeup of persons. Now, they have called others into uh, being optional. That would include behavioral health specialists. Uh, that would include pharmacy and community coordinators, but they haven't determined the level of license for any of those roles. Obviously, a PharmD would be your pharmacist, but the others aren't well determined. So it's unknown, but that will be defined either in the regs themselves or in uh, future webinars where they'll document the level of license that can bill on these E&M codes for the $50 face-to-face uh, -face visits. Okay. So I, I think the short answer then is stay tuned. And uh, maybe at this point, LPNs are not eligible to provide uh, the support given the information we have today. Correct. Um, Okay, um, let's uh, take our next question. The, can you talk to us about the in-person visit? Um, sometimes I think for many of our providers, when we use the language face-to-face, -face, um, people think of the hospice face-to-face -face requirements, so I want to separate it from that. Um, and just talk about the um, payment to the, the nurse or social worker, um, that $50 per visit payment is for what? So there will be a list of E&M codes by, um, by licensure that will be applicable to this program. They will all pay $50. Um, and so if the needs of the patient were for uh, a social worker specific set of services, those E&M codes would be listed and they will also give us uh, not only the codes, but the, the level of supervision required for those codes to be billable. Um, that's uh, to be determined, so stay tuned. But that's how those those visits will work. The first of one, uh, the first visit has been more specifically defined. You will have um, at the onset of attribution 60 days to send parts of your staff um, to that uh, particular location. Again, the home typically for our 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 particular uh, agencies on this call. Uh, and they will do an assessment which will include the creation, at least the beginning of the creation of a care plan. Um, and that will be the requirement for that specific first encounter. They'll give you, I'm sure, um, more details in the application process, but that part has been specifically described in writing by CMS. Okay, fantastic. Um, so, can you talk about, Do we? I, and maybe we don't know the answer to this yet, certainly in the conversations I've been in, um, we don't know this, but emergencies like falls, hip fractures, how are they handled um, in this model? So the same as they would be um, any 911 service, uh, even when someone's doing a, full, a formal nurse triage telephonic support, um, those protocols would still be followed uh, following 911 with an EMT or, or an ambulance service coming and busing the patient to an emergency room. What you do from there, though, again, would be tied back to how much data could you know about a patient uh, at that pre-registration. So if, if, we're, if we were to look at pre-registration events and it wasn't an emergent um, need, though it, it, it could appear that way. So let's say it's an anxiety attack, as an example, and, it's, and it, sh it is showing every indication that it's potentially shortness of breath and they're a congestive heart failure patient. All of those things would dictate an emergency room visit. If, if they get in the ambulance and then get to the emergency room and they've recognized that's a psychosocial need and they've given meds to support and calm the patient down, you then could intervene at that pre-registration event and be able to case manage that person back where the hospital's still going to see shortness of breath and chest pain if that's what they presented with as an admission event. So you need to apply your team based upon um, following the traditional standard of care, which is a 911 event's going to happen as it should, 
But if you can determine over the course of that journey that there's an opportunity to divert the admission, you could you could and should divert that admission. So, and that's in keeping with that that goal of all of this, which is um, avoiding unnecessary hospitalizations, and that's um, that is throughout a lot of our um, a lot of the information we have on this program. Um, great. So the uh, the states who aren't in the um, eligible status, do we have any information at this point on when they will be added? So the that always depends on how. Um, successful the program in its initial year is. If it's really good, and, and by really good, I mean we, we do what hospices have done for 35 years, which is to manage the, the total patient needs. If we do enough of it in this every other month paradigm to diminish hospital spend, I would bet many donuts that that will mean that next year the rest of the markets come online. Um, okay. If we don't, and there's a lackluster adoption and or there's a lackluster financial outcome, then they'll, they would try to tweak it and then roll it out. So that may take another year before it gets out. So you want your agencies that come in in this first year to be heroes in this program and deliver incredible clinical and financial outcomes so that the rest of the states turn on and we have, again, access to some 200% of our current patients served as visible pipeline for hospice. Okay, I think we probably have time for one or two more questions. So is, uh, next, next one, is there an expectation that the um, hospice manage the overall care for the patients in the same way a PCP does? So no, I, managing like a traditional primary care means that you're often managing fills and repeat, on repeat meds and, and diagnostics to ensure that those fills are warranted at the current therapeutic level. Um, none of those services are required. That really would, if you could do those services today, you'd, you'd fit into model one or model three. Um, if you, we think most of our agencies, sort of regardless of where they are on that spectrum of being hospice only, some, some pre-hospice or much pre-hospice, we still think m most of what they provide isn't traditional primary care, and so therefore they would opt for model two. And in model two, you're more coordinating the care and providing access to the care for primary care services than you are doing the care of primary care services. Okay, fantastic. And then our last question, um, certainly not the last question there is in our, either in our chat box or in the Q&A, um, but if you do not have a home health license in your area, uh, will the serious illness population model allow home visits by RNs and social workers under the hospice license regardless of state licensing requirements? So that's a lot to unpack. So let's, let's unpack it first by talking about SIP. So SIP is gonna define very specific um, kinds of care that can happen under the option two under primary care first. Those e &M codes will pay out at the current fee schedule of $50 for all of those uh, in-person at home visits. So that's known. Um, what is also known is that, that you can be a Part B practice by definition in this paradigm for SIP means that you have the ability to potentially refer to home health or to potentially refer to a hospice as appropriate when you qualify for those things. You will not be able to apply a hospice benefit under the SIP paradigm unless you qualify that patient for hospice. Same as with home health. I'm not sure I'm answering the specifics of that question, but there isn't a need for home health certification or licensure at the state to perform the services of SIP. There is a specific requirement for them to hold licensure for RN, licensed social worker, MDDO, or, or nurse practitioner. Individually. Correct. Correct? Yeah. So Correct. I think the question um, that this uh, questioner asked uh, was asking was, it, does your license, I mean, is this kind of outside state licensure for hospice or home health or whatever? And it sounds like from what we know today, it is. Is that, would that be your sense as well? It, it is. It will, um, usually you'll cr create under any of these paradigms, you'll create a Part B tax ID number. If you don't have one, you could start building that. That would be a good readiness thing for you to do. That typically takes only a few days. Now, it's a state dependency, so... If there was a rush on that being stood up, um, you could see it taking a little bit longer, but I don't think it's going to affect the eight-week period that you'd have to get into this application with that being done. 
I would recommend everybody figure out what your branding is, figure out what your, your um, logos are, your TVAs are, and then also at the same time, start aligning yourself to the state requirements for becoming a Part B practice. Though you're not going to deliver traditional primary care under that practice or geriatrician care uh, under that subspecialty, you are going to perform uh, under SIP using that Part B. And so you'll bill the 275 Part B and you'll bill, uh, bill the ENS codes for, or ENM codes, I'm sorry, for um, Part B under that part of your structure under the 10 or tax ID number that is stood up under SIP. Okay. Um, fantastic. And um, Kendra, I'll turn it back over to you. Yeah, thank you everyone for joining us. We had great attendance. I know this is a lot of information to take in. That's why we're really excited to be partnering with Jeremy and Eclivity, um, just to simplify it as much as possible. And I know what your, you know, the assistance you can help uh, our members is going to be just that, a tremendous help. And just a reminder to everyone, uh, the slides and recording of this webinar will be available on our website. I know we were getting a lot of questions about that. So if you go to nhpco.org backslash edge and click on the business webinar series, there is the part one of this webinar along with the slides there now. And it'll um, give us a day or two to get the second part up, but you can find all of those, um, part one and part two, the recording and the slides available. And as Judy mentioned, there were quite a few questions that we weren't able to get to, so we can pull those and see if we can't put together an FAQ to post as well, because we definitely want to make sure we're um, getting everyone the help they need to, to sift through all this information. And, and just one more thing, as, um, as we've been hearing about this, certainly um, NHPCO has been very involved with um, the folks at CMMI, the Centers for Medicare and Medicaid Innovation, um, to, to uh, have ongoing dialogue and conversation with them. Um, and we had our, our most recent call um, just, re just uh, this week. So I'm um, very interested to make sure that um, we um, have input, which we've had, and they're anxious to listen to us, um, but also that we know exactly um, when the uh, application is coming out, which no one knows seems to know the answer to that yet. But we'll we'll all be sitting on the edge of our seat until that time. All right. Thank you again, everyone. Stay tuned for part three. We'll work on that schedule and we'll get everything posted to the website. And if you have any additional questions, you can email edge at nhpco.org. Thank you so much. Thank you.